All right, well, hey, good morning, everyone. Welcome again to Alpine. We are so glad that you are here with us today, this morning. A special welcome to you if you are maybe new here or visiting, maybe you're here for the very first time. We're really glad to have you here this morning to be able to worship God together and pursue God together. My name is Steve. I'm one of the pastors here, and it is great to be here with you today to to dig into God's Word and to continue to understand uh, the book of Ephesians we've been looking at for the last uh, several weeks. You know, we started this series called Get Rich. And uh, to some of you who are disappointed, it's not an Amway series or like a pyramid scheme about how to get rich, anything like that. We are looking at the book of Ephesians and going verse by verse of this book and discovering all of the riches that are available to us as followers of Jesus. That's kind of the theme of the book of Ephesians. You go through it. Uh, the book of Ephesians, if you haven't been here, it was a letter written by the Apostle Paul, uh, written to the church at Ephesus around 60 AD or so. And he's describing for them all of the riches that are available to us in Christ. And now these riches are far better than money. The stuff that we can experience in Christ, it's so much infinitely more uh, amazing and powerful than just earthly wealth. And yet that's what we can experience as followers of Jesus. And so each week we've kind of gone through the book and we've discovered some of the different benefits that, that Christ makes available to us when we are united to him in faith, when we are connected to him, we experience these blessings. And today we're gonna look at another one of the great great blessings we have as Christians, and that is the ability to connect with God in prayer. Now, I know that sometimes we don't really think about this, but I just want you to pause for a moment this morning and think about how absolutely amazing it is that you and I, whenever we want, can pause and we can talk to the one who created the universe. I mean, that's kind of a crazy thought when you think about it, that the almighty God allows us instant access to him anytime we want it. And yet so many of us fail to take advantage of that amazing gift that God offers to us. You know, I was thinking, uh, I was thinking um, about my mom. And uh, my mom is, uh, it, she's in her 70s. That's as specific as I'll be, because that's not polite, you know, and she might be watching this, hi, mom. Um, but here's what I was thinking about my mom. You know, she is one of these people that it took us a long time to convince her to get a cell phone. And uh, when she finally got a cell phone, she got the uh, Motorola flip phone in about, you know, uh, 2002 or so. She had that phone, you know, and that's the phone she has had the entire time. And we've been trying to convince her over the last several years, mom, you need to get yourself an iPhone or at least some sort of a smartphone, you know, it's, ah, I would never need that. What we'll possibly get those things are a fad, whatever. So we've been trying to convince her. She wasn't interested. And finally, about a year and a half ago, we convinced my mom to get an iPhone and we were all excited. Mom, you're going to love this. This is going to be great. You can do so much cool stuff with it. But here's the thing we've discovered now. My mom basically uses her iPhone as if it was a Motorola flip phone. Um, she, she doesn't do anything with it. When she turns it on, which is about 20% of the time, she just barely uses it to make phone calls. This really struck me because a while ago they were coming to visit and uh, they, they pulled up into our driveway. They live in Seattle, so they drove up my mom and dad and, and they pulled up into our driveway and the kids, we went out to greet her in the driveway. And, and the first thing I noticed that really struck me was they were fidgeting with their, their dash mounted GPS system, this old Garmin system they have that they put up on their dashboard. They had to unplug it and put it away in the, in the glove compartment. And as she's getting out, I'm unloading the bags for her. And one of the bags I unload, I look down and there's her old digital camera in there and her camcorder with extra tapes just in case, you know, to catch some moments of the grandkids. And then we come into the house and we're sitting down and we're, we're kind of sitting at the kitchen table just talking and catching up. And I notice her get into her purse and she gets out her calendar book and she's flipping through her calendar to make a note about somebody she wants to do. And then she had to find out that person's phone number. So she puts the calendar down, goes back into her purse and gets out her, her little black book, her contact book she's had for years and flips through to find her friend's contact number to write it down in her calendar. You're picking up where I'm going with this. But the real killer was this. That night, she says, son, um, can I get into your office and get on your computer? I need to check my, my electronic mail. And I said, oh, okay, mom, you can, you can check your email. But you know, you don't need to get onto my computer in an office to do that. Mom, do you know you can do that right on your phone? 
And she's like, ass, ah, you know. But so here's the thing. Here's what really struck me about this. Here's my mom. God bless her. And she has this amazing device that she can hold in her hands, right, that can guide her places anywhere on the planet she wants to go, right? She, she has access to the World Wide Web, right? She can ask Siri anything about anything in the world. She can find out instantly, right? She can check her electronic mail on it. She can, she can take pictures and videos in high def. She can do all these amazing things, and yet she doesn't do anything with it. She doesn't use any of those features. And I thought, man, that is a, it's kind of a great picture of how a lot of Christians live our life. See, we hold in our hands this amazing ability to connect with God, to tap into his wisdom and his strength and his knowledge and his power and his comfort and his love anytime we want, and yet so often we don't. We kind of use prayer like an old flip phone. You know, we barely use it, and when we do, we just kind of maybe ask you know, some self-focused prayers every once in a while. You see, here's the thing, is that uh, if we pray, and again, I know that, that can be a big if for a lot of us, but if we pray, we tend kind of just to pray for ourselves and kind of our immediate physical needs. Now, that's not entirely bad because Jesus taught us when he taught us to pray that we should pray for ourselves. Give us this day our daily bread. So it's okay to pray for immediate physical needs. That's great. But so many of us treat prayer like that's all there is to it. Just asking God for stuff, kind of like a cosmic vending machine when we need something. And yet we miss out on the real power of prayer. And here's the thing that I really want us to see today as we continue on in the book of Ephesians is that it, it strikes me that as you look throughout the Bible and you look at the prayers of the apostles in the New Testament, you'll discover they pray pretty differently than most of us pray. First of all, here's what you'll discover, especially look at the Apostle Paul. When he prays, he rarely prays for himself. I mean, every once in a while, he'll give a little shout out for one of his needs, but almost all of his prayers are focused on lifting up the needs of other people. Now, that's kind of convicting because let's be honest, how many people do we have in our life that we really, we genuinely love and care about, and yet if we're honest, we never really pray for them, but yet we're quick to pray for ourselves. And then here's the other thing I think it's instructive about Paul's prayers are when he prays for other people, he doesn't pray the way we typically do for other people because when we actually get around to praying for other people, usually it involves some sort of crisis in their life. You know, somebody has gotten sick or somebody needs a job or somebody has some problem with this or that in their life. And so we hear about it, we say, oh, let's pray for them. And so we'll pray for their ailment, whatever that crisis might be in their life. Now, again, that's good. I want to encourage you, keep doing that. Keep praying for those physical needs in your friend's life, in your family's life. But yet, it's striking when you read the prayers of the Apostle Paul, that's not how he prays at all. Again, very few of his prayers are focused on immediate physical needs. Instead, he prays in a very different way. And I think this is helpful for us. This is instructive for us. Because I think all of us want to pray better. Right? I don't think I've ever met anyone that's like, I think I pray maybe a little too much. I should cut back on the prayer time, you know, like, or I just, my prayers are too profound and too effective. I need to like, whoa, hold it back, right? We don't hear that, right? Most of us want to pray better, and yet we kind of don't know how. We've got people in your life, you'd like to pray for them, but it, it's hard to pray for people in your life. Sometimes it's like, gosh, I don't, I don't know what to say outside of they, you know, have that problem with their leg or whatever. Like, I don't know what to pray for. Or, or you have people in your life you pray for on a regular basis. Maybe, you're, maybe you pray for your spouse or your kids, or your family, whatever, and you can find yourself kind of praying the same things over and over again. It kind of feels a little bit repetitive maybe. And so I think this prayer we're going to look at today is very helpful and instructive because I think he gives us some great insight into a better way to pray, a better way to really lift up the people in our life that we care about in prayer. And I hope that you will take seriously the opportunity to do that. Because let me just say, I mean, think about this. Imagine if you had the ability to do something that would guarantee to, to make a positive difference in someone's life. I mean, you knew it would help them. And it wouldn't cost you anything. You wouldn't have to go anywhere. And yet you knew you could make a profound impact in their life. Would you do it? Would you do something for your spouse, for your kids, for your best friend, for your coworker, for your neighbor? My guess is most of us would. So here's the thing, we can. It's called prayer. 
And yet so few of us tap into this, and this is one of the, the great riches we have as a follower of Christ. And so today we're going to look uh, in Ephesians chapter 3 and continue on in our study, and we're going to see this prayer, and we're going to see how it teaches us how we can pray ourselves for other people. Now again, just a reminder, the book of Ephesians is this, this letter written to the people in Ephesus. So this is a, a real letter written by a real person to real people, and so he's encouraging them. The Apostle Paul has this heart for this young Ephesian church that has grown up, this new church plant, and he cares about him. He, he wants to make sure that they really are grounded and strong and growing in their faith, and so he prays for them. And we're going to see the content of his prayer. But let's begin in verse 14, uh, where, we, where we picked it up, and let's see kind of how the, the start of this prayer begins. Let's kind of see the setup for this prayer. Here's, here's how it begins. Paul prays this. He says, when I think of all of this... I fall to my knees and pray to the Father, the creator of everything in heaven and on earth. So first notice this. He begins and he says, when I think of all of this. So what is the all of this he's referring to? Well, he's picking back up on a theme he started in verse 1 of this chapter. If you were here a couple weeks ago, we, we, for the first few weeks of the series, actually, we, we kind of talked through chapters 1 and 2 and the start of 3, and the, the Apostle Paul describes all of these riches that we have in Christ. And then starting in, in chapter 3, he takes a little bit of an excursus that we looked at, where he kind of, he talks about the nation of Israel and, and, and the Gentiles and his role and how it all works together. But now he's coming back to this. And so he's kind of saying, now, let me think back. And so he's really referring to all that he's talked about up so far in this book, specifically all of the riches that we have in Christ. All those things we've talked about, the fact that we are chosen and elected by God, the fact that we are adopted by God into his own family, that we are his children, the fact that the Holy Spirit of God comes, he promises in chapter 1, verse 13, and the Spirit comes and indwells us, is sealed upon our hearts. I mean, all of the, this richness that we have in Christ. And he says, when I think of all of this, what's his response? I fall to my knees. And I love his response. I, I just fall to my knees in awe. I kind of picture this sort of like the way somebody falls on their knees before a king. And my wife and I, we just started watching this show on, on Netflix called uh, The Crown. Anyone watching this show? It's kind of like the story of Queen Elizabeth. I know I'm kind of a nerd, but I have kind of this weird little obsession with the royal family of England for some reason. I'm, I'm like intrigued by it. And, and it's so interesting watching this because every time somebody enters the presence of one of the royals, they have to bow. There's all these like rules and you know, obligations they have to do. And I think, man, that's kind of the picture here, what I thought of, that, that when Paul, he, he thinks about going into the presence of God and he falls on his knees. And what does he do? He prays. He prays, and he, he prays to the almighty creator in heaven and on earth. He's reminding us here that as he, as he prays, who is he praying to? The creator. I think it's a reminder to us that as we pray, we're not calling out to some weak sort of like JV type deity, right? We're calling out to the almighty, one and true, holy, eternal creator of all things in heaven and on earth. This is the God who has the power to change things. This is the God who is in control of things. That is who we are talking to. So don't forget that, that when we are calling out, we are not calling out to some weak, powerless God, but to the creator. But notice what he says right before that, though. Not, God isn't just this powerful, omnipotent being. He is also our Father. I pray to the Father, the creator of everything. So I think he's reminding us here that this almighty, powerful God is not just some distant, powerful force. He is also our heavenly Father. He also loves us and cares about us. He thinks of us as his children, his very own kids. And so that's just an encouragement to, to us. Man, when we pray, we are praying to a God who not only has the power to change things, but the God who is on our side, the God who loves us, who cares about us deeply and intimately like a perfect father does. And so in light of this reality, in light of this glorious truth of who God is and his love for us and his character and his power in our life, the Apostle Paul begins to pray. 
And we're going to see here, he prays for three specific things we're going to look at this morning as we work throughout this passage. Three things that, again, I think are instructive to us as we pray. Here's the first thing he prays for, and that's to pray for others to grow in the Holy Spirit's power. You see, I, what he's getting at here is life is hard. We all know this, right? Life is difficult, and we need power to get through the challenges in life. All of us have things about ourselves that we wish we could change. We probably all have some bad habits, some bad patterns of maybe sin that we hold on to, some things about our character that we know we don't like that that we would like to change, but it's hard, right? It's hard to change. All of us probably have difficult people in our life that we have to deal with. Some of them are coming over for dinner on Thursday. I get an amen out there, right? We got some hard people in our life. You know, that you got to deal with some difficult things or just hard personalities. Some of you have some some hurts from people, and and it's just hard to to, to deal with some people. Some of you are trying to do hard things for God. You want to step out in faith and do great things for God, and it's hard. Life is just difficult. Some of you are navigating, I know right now, through some tough situations, through some tough decisions that you have to make, and it's, it's hard. And in those moments... We need something beyond ourselves. And here's the good news. One of the riches we have in Christ is that as a Christian, you are not left on your own powerless, that you have a unique source of strength available to you if you would just tap into it. And that's what the Apostle Paul prays for the Ephesians. Starting in verse 16, here's what he says. He says, I pray that from his glorious unlimited resources that he will empower you with inner strength through his spirit, then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust in him. He says, I pray that from God's own well of strength that he will empower you. And that, that, is, that is good news because life is tough and life's really tough when you feel like you don't have the power to do anything. You just kind of feel like you're stuck That's what a lot of people feel, just kind of stuck in this life, lacking any power. I remember when I was was a kid, I grew up on the water in Seattle, and I was sailing, and I was working uh, on this boat. It was on a sailboat, and this was like a really nice sailboat that I'd been hired to to work for a day on, and it was like like an 80-foot, like a $2 million, super fancy sailing yacht right? And the owner was some rich Microsoft executive, you know, and we're out there and he hired to go out and he wanted to sail his boat. And, and I mean, this boat was like amazing. It had every fancy gadget and whistle you could possibly imagine. I mean, it was like this beautiful boat. I remember being out in the middle of Puget Sound on this boat and we were not going anywhere. You know why? Because there was no wind. I mean, it was just dead calm that day. And we had the sails raised and they were just kind of just kind of fluttering in the wind. I remember looking down the little speedometer thing, and it said we were going 0.1 knots. I mean, that's like slower than the current moves, you know? Like, we were just not going anywhere. And the owner was like frustrated. He's like, I want, I can't, I bought this $2 million boat. I want to go out and sail this thing. And we're like, well, you can't do anything if there's no wind. And that's how a lot of us feel, I think, in life. And I got all this stuff going on in my life, and I'm just sitting here, and I want to move, but I'm just stuck and you feel like you're going 0.1 knots because you've got no wind, no power. Well, Paul is praying here that it doesn't have to be that way. I, I, I pray that they don't feel stuck, that they would be empowered with inner strength through the Spirit of God. Now, I love what he says here. He prays that this power comes from God's glorious unlimited resources. He's not asking us to conjure up our own inner strength. And and he's saying God's resources aren't like there's a cap to it. God only has so much power to spread around, so you get a little bit and you get a little bit. Sorry, I ran out for you. No, It it is unlimited, God's resources. And his prayer is that God's resources would come and make an effect on our life, that he would strengthen us on the inside, our, our inner strength. And the Bible teaches that, you know, we all have this, this inner person. There's different ways the Bible describes it. We all have that, that inside of us that's kind of the seat of your, your, uh, your will and your heart and your emotions and your mind and your consciousness. There's that inner man that we all have. And that inner man, by the way, according to the Bible, is broken by sin. And so if we're going to have any real change from the inside out, 
It has to come from God, from his spirit coming in and giving us that, that inner strength we need to overcome those difficult temptations in our life, to deal with those difficult people, to make wise decisions, to have the spirit grow its fruit in our life of love and, and peace and patience and goodness and kindness and self-control, all those things that comes as the spirit comes and, and he strengthens us inside. And then he uses this, this kind of interesting image, and then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust in him. You see, when you trust in Jesus, the Bible says that he comes and he takes up residence in your heart. See, the Bible says that if you're a Christian, you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ alone for the forgiveness of your sin, God isn't out there someplace. God lives within you. And so what Paul is saying here is, as God is inside of you, you want, you want inner strength to kind of clean up your life so that it's a suitable home for Jesus. That's kind of the image he's painting here. Think about this, right? Again, a lot of you are maybe hosting Thanksgiving at your house this week, and so a lot of you are going to be doing some cleaning this week, right? And some of you guys have your honeydew list from your wife. You've got to get up, and you've got to clean those corners that never get clean, and you've got to put stuff away. You know, that's kind of how it goes, and you're entertaining people. Or you know, sometimes, I know for us, when we have a, a guest coming to stay, we have a guest room, and somebody's going to be in our house for a couple days, there's always kind of this mad dash. You've got to clean things up down there in the basement, make it look nice, you know? And, and so what I often find myself doing is taking and shoving stuff into the closet, it. Hopefully they don't see that. Under the bed. Just move it out to the garage, behind the Toyota. Nobody will notice it out there, right? And, but here's the thing. If somebody were coming, not just for a couple days to visit, but really to live in my guest room in my house, I'd probably clean it up a little bit better. I'd want to make it a warm, welcoming, inviting place for that person to dwell. And that's kind of the, the image here that, that Paul is painting. Saying, God is, is living in your hearts. So don't let it be cluttered up with all of that just stuff, that sinful stuff, that brokenness that's there. Ask for the Spirit to strengthen you so that your heart is a suitable home for Him. I mean, think about that in your life. Think about all those deep, dark corners of your soul, those thoughts that you have that nobody knows about, those desires that you know nobody else really knows about, those broken ideas that you have in your life, those things you struggle with that nobody else maybe even knows. Do you think your life, knowing all that, is that a good home for Jesus? Is that a good place where he wants to hang out? And so Paul says, pray that you will have the inner strength to clean that up through his power. Again, this isn't a self-help project. This is through the power of God that he will help you to make your life a suitable home for him to dwell. So I just want you to think about that, that amazing gift that you can pray for someone. So here's what I want to do. Here's what we're going to do something a little bit different this morning. We, we don't normally do, and hopefully nobody will feel too weird about this. But I want to give you a chance this morning to put into practice what we're talking about right now. And so we're going to, a couple times this morning, take a little pause to pray just quietly, silently in your seat about this issue. So we're going to pray in just a minute. Don't get excited. The sermon's not over. Right? I'm not closing in prayer. But I want to give you just a minute, and I want you to think about someone in your life that you know could use some of this inner strength that comes from God. Somebody that you know in your life, maybe it's a spouse or a kid or a loved one or a neighbor or a friend or whatever, that is going through some hard things and you know they need some of that empowering inner strength from the Holy Spirit. I just want to take a second right now and give you a chance to pray for them like the Apostle Paul did. So think about that person and just take a second here. We're just going to have a moment of quiet and just pray uh, you know, a quick sentence or two just real briefly, to pray for this person. Let's go ahead and do that now. Amen. I know there's a short period of prayer here. You can, this is the only time you're allowed to pray for them. Go home and pray for them later, but we want to just take a chance to do that now. So pray for those people. Pray that God would not just give you that inner strength, but help other people to do that as well. That's the first thing the Apostle Paul prays. Let's go on to the next thing. The next thing we see he prays for uh, is for others to know God's love. So it's so sad to me that so many people go through life and they don't really know or experience the love of God. So many people go through life and the only experience they have with God, when they think of God, it's sort of a fearful, frightful, anxious thing. They, they just have this idea that God is out there and he's upset and he's wagging his finger and looking disappointed at them and he's so bummed out by you. 
A lot of people just have that, or they feel that God is just kind of distant and cold. But so many people miss out on this crazy idea that God, when he looks at us, he is full of love full of compassion, full of grace, full of mercy. That is God's primary attribute in, in, in how he describes his feelings toward us. In the book of Exodus chapter 34 in the Bible, it's the very first time in the Bible that God self-describes himself. This is really interesting. This is the very first time God says, here is what I'm like. And in Exodus 34, he, he re- reveals himself to Moses. And you know the first words out of his mouth when God reveals himself? He says, I am compassionate and I am loving, and I am gracious. That is the primary attribute of God, his compassion and his mercy and his love and his grace. And yet so often we, we treat him like that's not true about him. And so look what the Apostle Paul says. As he, as he continues to pray for people, here his prayer continues like this. He prays that your roots will grow down deep into God's love and keep you strong. And may you have the power to understand, as all God's people should, how wide and how long and how high and how deep his love really is. May you experience the love of Christ, though it is too great to understand fully. I love this language. He starts off, and his prayer is that their roots would would grow down deep into the love of God in order to keep them strong. What does that mean? I was thinking about this, you know, uh, about a month or so ago, whatever that was, we had that tornado that came through here that went through, you know, Washington Terrace. It was really bad. And and, uh, we live up in South Ogden. So after the tornado went through, I remember driving down to Washington Terrace just because I was curious. I wanted to kind of check out some of the damage. I'm one of those guys that wanted to go see it. And so I went into this park. It's called Friendship Park in in that area. And I remember our kids play soccer there. and, And I walked out to the park and I see these three huge evergreen trees that had blown over in the corner of the park. And it was pretty, I wanted to go look at it. I mean, these are giant trees. They're probably 80 foot tall evergreen trees just blown over on their side. And it was so interesting because you can see, you know, if you've ever seen this, you know, where they just kind of pulls up the ground and you have that kind of grass, you know, underneath it. And you could see their whole root system. And so I was kind of checking out. What struck me was the root system for this incredibly huge tree wasn't in fact that big. It wasn't very wide. It didn't go down very deep, which is probably why it blew over in the storm. You see, that's what he's saying here. He's saying he doesn't want our life to get blown over when storms come. He doesn't want our life to be so easily knocked down. He wants us to have these deep, strong roots that will make us profoundly strong in him. And so what do those roots need to grow into? They need to grow into the love of God. Now think about that. There's so many different things he could have said that would cause us to have deep roots, but he chose to say into the love of God. He didn't say that your roots might grow down deep into knowledge of God, knowing God is good. He didn't say grow down deep into serving. Serving is good, but there's something profound. He wants our roots to grow. If we're going to be strong, our roots need to grow down deep into the love of God. And his prayer is that we would have the power just to begin to understand this. He understands it's it's really hard to get this, just how wide and how deep and how high. I mean, it's kind of beyond the ability for words to describe. I mean, he even says in the next verse, I like how he says there, that I want you to try to experience it, though it's too great to fully get it. But his hope and his prayer is that we would begin just to grasp a bit of the love of God because he knows how powerful and transformational it is in our life, how it moves us from a place of fear to a place of of, of grateful confidence as we stand before our God and how that just totally changes our life. Again, I know it's hard for some people. Some of you have some, some background that causes this to be difficult. Maybe you grew up with a really difficult earthly father who was not loving, who was not kind, who was not gracious. And so it's hard for you to imagine a heavenly father who is those things. Maybe some of you grew up and and God is just kind of this distant idea. So it's hard for you to really imagine that God is intimately concerned about you. Maybe some of you have all kinds of self-loathing. And you just have all this guilt and shame from some mistakes that you've done in your life. And you just feel like so bad about yourself. It's hard to imagine that God actually loves you. 
But Paul prays, God, God, I just, I want them to begin just to understand a little bit of how much that they are loved by you. You know, there's this great hymn, I grew up singing it. If you grew up in a Christian church, maybe you sang it as well. It's called The Love of God. And it's kind of an old school, 1800 style hymn. We don't usually quote those here on Sunday morning. But I just want to read just one uh, verse from this hymn, because I think it paints this beautiful picture, talking about the love of God. And he says this, the hymn writer says, Could we with ink the ocean fill, and were the skies of parchment made, Uh, were every stock on earth a quill and every man a scribe by trade. To write the love of God above would drain the oceans dry, nor could the scroll contain the whole, though stretched from sky to sky. Did you pick up on that, that image he paints there? He says, imagine that every ocean in the world was filled with ink. And the sky was one big blank piece of paper. And every person, all seven billion of us on earth, our full-time job was to take a pen and just use that ink to write down the attributes of the love of God. We'd never be able to do it. We would never be able to fully articulate how wide and how deep and how profound the love of God is. But see, if we're going to experience God in any real way, it has to begin by understanding that. Maybe the most profound way in which we see the love of God is in the person of Jesus and in what Jesus did for us. The Apostle Paul describes this in another, in another letter he wrote to the church at Rome. In the book of Romans, chapter 5 and verse 8, it says this, But God showed you his great love by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. Literally, it says, but God demonstrated his love for us. God put his love on display for us in that while we were still sinful people, While we were still messed up and far from him, by nature objects of wrath, by nature separated from God, by nature his enemies, in that condition, God said, I want to show you how much I love you by dying for you. That is the most profound display of love. It's one thing to die for somebody that you really care deeply about. It's another thing to die for somebody who is your enemy. And that's what Christ did while we were sinners. That is profound love. Let me just say, If you've never experienced salvation for the first time, you're never going to be able to fully get your mind around the love of God. And some of you need to do that. Some of you are here and you've never really experienced the love of God or salvation because you're still trying to work for it yourself. You still think it's up to you to try to be a good enough person that hopefully God will accept you if you try to try to check all the right boxes and be a good enough person. Let me encourage you, if that's what you've been thinking, you're you're missing out on the truth. The amazing good news of the Bible is this, that while we were sinners, while we had done nothing to deserve anything, Jesus died for us, and he gives each and every one of us the opportunity. If you would trust in him, you can experience that salvation. If you're not sure if you've done that, let me encourage you. Talk to the friend that maybe invited you here today or talk to one of us leaders here after the service. We'd love to share with you how you can experience that salvation day because that's how you begin to experience the love of God, and that's so important because, again, the love of God will change you. It is transformational in your life. So, again, let's take a moment right now and just pause and pray. Think of somebody, maybe the same person, maybe somebody different in your life who needs to experience the love of God in maybe a new way in their life. Let's just take a moment and pray for that person. Go ahead. Amen. One other thing that we see in this prayer is the prayer wraps up. We've already seen his prayer for people to experience the the power of God and the love of God, but there's one more really important thing he wants us to, to see, and that's this, that we pray for people to experience God's fullness, to experience the fullness of God. This is maybe the most... Uh, difficult thing to get your head around in this prayer. It's kind of the most profound and, and sort of intangible, but yet it's very important because he prays for it. Look how the, the verse continues. He says this. He says, Then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. See, his prayer is that we would be made complete as we begin to experience the fullness of life and power that comes from God. Again, this is kind of a deep concept here. What does this mean to be made complete? What he's basically describing here is there's this fullness of life and power that resides within God. 
And he wants for us to experience that fullness, not a little portion of God, not just a little taste of God. He wants the fullness of God's life and power to come and just indwell us so that we could be made complete or mature in him. Now, he's not saying that we might become God ourselves or something like that, but he's saying that we might not experience God at a distance, not just a little bit of God, but we would experience the fullness of the power and the love of God in our life, that God would be continually there pouring out his blessings and his riches into our life. So it's not a picture of like a a dad who dies with a fortune and leaves an inheritance to his kids, and you get to spend that until it runs out. That's not what he's saying. He's picturing God like a living father who is wealthy beyond our wildest imagination, who never runs out of resources, and he doesn't just sort of leave it to us. He is constantly there in our life, and he's just sharing it with us day in and day out, giving to us of his richness and his love and his grace and his mercy. He prays that we might just experience that fullness in our life. But then I love how this prayer ends because it kind of like he gets to a point and he realizes that words fail him. He's like, I don't know how else to even communicate. This is, like, this is why I picture what's going on is that, that Paul is like, I don't even know else what to say here. How do I get pr- to communicate this profound truth? And so he just ends this prayer by bursting out in this beautiful doxology. And he ends his prayer with this beautiful statement of praise. And he says, now... All glory to God, who is able through his mighty power at work within us to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. Glory to him in the church and in Jesus Christ throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. I mean, he just bursts out in this prayer and says, God, you are able to do infinitely more than we could ever ask or think or imagine. So God, just do that. God, we we praise you. We praise that you are a God who is able to bring your mighty work to infinitely more than you can imagine in their life. Now think about that. That's his prayer for you. Think about whatever it is that you feel in your life that this is just too big for me. This problem is too overwhelming. This, this challenge is too, is too uh, hard. This person is too difficult. That wound is too deep. Whatever it is, Paul's prayer is that God would do infinitely more than we might ever even be able to ask or think of. Now let me remind you, Paul wouldn't pray this if it wasn't possible. Think about that. He wouldn't have said something he knew wasn't really going to happen. He prayed for something because he knew this is the possibility that all of us can experience. We can experience something that is infinitely more, the fullness of God that is beyond what our, our mind can even imagine. Think about that in your own life. What might that be? You know, I'm so encouraged when I I have the privilege of being a pastor, so I get kind of a behind-the-scenes look into a lot of people's lives, and I get to hear these amazing stories of what God is doing in people's lives. And it's so encouraging. And I wish I had time to tell more and more stories. Let me just share a couple quick stories. There's a guy at one of our other campuses named Brian, and he's a guy that grew up in, in another faith, uh, and in his 30s, he started to realize, wait a minute, this doesn't make sense. And he started to search the, uh, the Jesus of the Bible and search out biblical truth. And he came to recognize the truth. And so he put his faith and trust in Jesus. And, and his life has been radically changed by this. But here's the thing. All of his family thinks he's nuts. They think he's, he's lost it, including his wife, who's threatened to leave him over this. And yet when you talk to him, I mean, his life, he's just on fire. His face just lights up. He's so excited uh, about the love of Jesus and what it means and the truth he has discovered. Only God can change a person like that and be willing to stand against his whole family who says he's crazy. There's another person at one of our campuses, and, and she's a person that shared the story that, that she grew up and she attended church every Sunday. And if you would have seen her, you would have thought she's the perfect person. But she said, uh, she, this all came out, she said, I was leaving a complete double life. I was one way at church and with my family, but I had this whole other secret life full of all kinds of darkness and dysfunction and addiction and all this brokenness that was too shameful even to, to think about. And yet God convicted her in church one day and she just said, I, I can't do this. And she, she confessed to God, and then she confessed to her family, and, and all of a sudden, God now is radically reshaping that family and bringing healing and wholeness. I mean, these are kind of things that, that blow families up, that in any earthly sense, people are like, oh, that's too much. You're just going to have to, that family's just done. 
And yet God is able to do infinitely more than we could ask or imagine. And God is bringing healing and wholeness to that family. And they are moving forward in the strength of Jesus. I mean, it's awesome. See, God is doing this kind of stuff. Maybe God is doing something like that in your life right now. Or maybe you look at your life and you say, you know, I really don't feel the power of God very much in my life. I kind of feel like, "Mm." it doesn't have to be that way. Don't believe the lie from the enemy that you have to be stuck and that you don't really have any power. God can do infinitely more than you could ever ask or imagine. So again, let me stop and let's pray one more time for somebody in your life that needs that kind of help. Somebody in your life that needs to experience the fullness of God, that needs something big, infinitely more than they could even think or imagine. Take a minute and let's pray for that person right now. Amen. As we wrap this up and we wrap up this this chapter here, uh, our hope and our prayer is that you see what an incredible blessing that prayer is, how powerful prayer is, and that you don't treat prayer like an old Motorola flip phone, but that you try to experience the fullness, not just for yourself, but for other people. And so I want to close, I want to close by praying for you by praying for this congregation, for our church. And I just want to pray this morning the words right out of Ephesians chapter 3. So would you just join me as we close in prayer now, right out of this chapter. Almighty God, when I think of all of this, when I think of all of the riches that we receive from you, all that you have done for us, I come before you in thanks. Our Father, the creator of all things, I pray that from your glorious, unlimited resource that you will empower these people here this morning in this service, that you will empower them to be strengthened in their inner person so that Christ might dwell in their hearts. God, I ask that their roots would grow down deep into your love and that they might have the power to understand, as all God's people should, how wide and how deep and how long and how high your love truly is. May they experience the love of Christ, though it is too great to fully understand. May they be made complete with all of the fullness of life and the power that comes from you. And now all glory be to you, you who is able through your mighty work within us to accomplish infinitely more than we might be able to ever ask or think. Glory to him in the church, in this church, And in Christ Jesus, throughout all generations, forever and ever, amen. Amen.